Welcome to the second round of Fate Stay Night. You see, Shiro Emiya is an indecisive guy, so any of three lovely ladies can guide him down a different path to the story. While the Noble Saber took center stage last time, we've come to need one of the mightiest forces known to weave kind, the Sundere. This time, professional exposition machine Rin Tosake is our waifu of the story. So let's wind back the clock to the third night of this tale, where Shiro manages to stop Saber in the most life-changing of ways, by stopping her from teaching Archer Division. Rin, grateful for not having her servant become half the man he is, decides to educate Shiro on what's going on, because of course she would take the chance to expose it! Why wouldn't she? After experiencing the wonders of Shiro's ignorance, Rin decides to take him to the nearby church so Shiro can get a summary of what Kirei tells him the Fey route. On the way back, Shio realizes that Rin is not so secretly a good person. Before they can get home, though, it's a lost child o'clock, and Berserker is here to play. Since Archer isn't nearly dead, though, Saber has the option of being a little more tactical in her approach and not get completely demolished because she is getting back up from Mr. Red here. Shiro follows the fight to the graveyard, where he suddenly gets a bad feeling and turns to see Archer way off in the distance, aiming right for Berserker and Saber. He rushes to get her out of the way and saves her from the blast. Heracles doesn't really give a shit though, and the lost child isn't amused, so they just head off. Meanwhile, Shiro has a rock in his back and blacks out, all while being able to sense Archer's smug smile. If that's not the perfect prelude to what this arc entails, I don't know what is. He wakes up to Rin treating him, and she lectures him about being more ruthless, to which he responds by pulling out the old know you and she concedes to him that she's being too nice she uses a metaphor about flab that almost ends with shiro visiting the taiga dojo by calling her fat a little later shiro finds saber and finds that rin has infected her as she exposits about servants NPs, and true names she also mentions that as a saber she is best suited for upfront direct conversa co conversations i mean i guess that's true <clears throat> best suited for upfront direct confrontations, which no Saber does not excuse you from rarely thinking your fights through. And now that he hasn't seen Saber get destroyed by Heracles in this timeline, Shiro isn't absolutely fucking stupid about not letting Saber fight, and that is refreshing. Taiga calls him up for a lunch delivery, so Team Lawful Good is on the job. He hangs out all day, and we see how scarily good he is at archery. Man hits the target as naturally as breathing, and he has inhumanly good vision. I do not want to be on his bad side. Man is the ultimate ranger. On the way home, Taiga gets concerned by the blonde girl who's been stalking them all day. Shiro then introduces Taiga and the girl who won't be relevant for one more arc to save her, and they take it a lot better this time. That being said, Taiga arranges for her and Sakura to stay at Shiro's place for a few days, just to make sure Shiro's behaving and to make sure Sakura doesn't lose her chance. She had no chance. Later that night, we see Ren is tracking Caster. A bunch of people around town are falling unconscious, all because Caster is giving the town a big suck to get people's life force out. Rin gets pissed by Caster sucking everyone dry and decides to target her. Archer brings up Shiro and Rin tells him that the poor guy is getting the crap beat out of him if he does anything dumb. Anyway, the next day Shiro goes to school without Saber, the only person to keep him safe during the Grail War, where Rin is. But it'll be fine, only has to stay where a bunch of people are so she can't do anything. Turns out though, one of Emiya's friends has gone missing and he sticks around after school to get info on her, leaving him late enough that most people have cleared out of the building. Rin does not miss this opportunity and role plays being the quiet kid in America trying to shoot Shiro with a curse. The desperate boy keeps alive long enough to get down the stairs, but the chase is brought to a quick close by a scream echoing through the halls. Shiro and Rin immediately head down to the first floor to check things out. They see a girl on the floor and rush over to help her. While Rin uses Magecraft to heal her, Spike flies in from outside and Shiro takes a blow to save her. He runs outside where he gets absolutely absolutely bodied by Ryder while glimpsing a professional ass hat watching him through the trees. Ren saves the day and Shiro inexplicably says nothing about Shinji being there. Why? Rin brings Shiro home to treat him, but his wound is somehow already healed. They chalk it up to his connection with Saber and forget about it. Then the two team up and Shiro gets a peek at Rin's inner sundere. They chat a bit about their upbringings before she has Archer escort him home. Shiro and Archer really don't get along. The two argue when they get there, which ends with Archer saying servants have no free will and that he has no wish for the grail. That night, Taiga tells Shiro that his friend was found and he decides Sakura is staying longer because he doesn't trust Shinji. Then he tells Saber about the team up with Ren. She isn't happy she wasn't consulted, but is glad that he teamed up with someone, well, competent. And then we get to see a dream about Archer's unrewarding life. No wonder he's an asshole. The next day at school, Shiro finds out that Shinji has spread rumors about his missing friend and restrains himself from breaking Shinji's nose, automatically making Shiro second worst boy. Because the only thing worse than sparing Shinji from pain is being Shinji. At lunch, Shiro and Ren talk about the bounded field and how easy it is to detect a master. Ren will proceed to never sense another master in this story. Despite trying to murder him a few days ago, Shinji asks Shiro if he wants to team up for the war. 
He obviously says no and lets Shinji go because he's giving him benefit of the doubt. Yeah, sure, Shiro, not trying to hurt anyone. Definitely did not try to kill you a few days ago. I remember, kids, this is why self-worth is a necessity. He also has Shiro send Sakura home because this isn't her route and she really needs to get out of this one. That night, after keeping the tiger from causing mass destruction in the kitchen, Shiro starts sleepwalking all the way up to the temple because Castor's put a spell on him and dragged him up there. Turns out that the guy who has the strongest servant having little resistance to magecraft is a prime opportunity that can't be passed up. Lucky for him though, Saber noticed Shiro's missing, so she rushes to the temple just to get stopped by assassin. No need to fear though, Archer is here to save the day. Castor is arrogant and underestimates him, leading to her almost getting killed by his bow. The only reason she gets to keep breathing is because Archer thinks she has the best shot of killing Heracles. This naturally infuriates Shiro, the boy scout who goes after caster to finish the job bad night for him though because archer thinks the boy would look better six feet under assassin however proves himself to be a total bro and lets saber pass to saber master also that he can get a good undistracted duel with her later thanks sasuke you are a certified cool dude shiro gets himself over to his servant and archer tries to follow after him, but sasuke holds him off letting team lawful good escape back at the house saber and shiro are surprisingly calm about archer betraying them saber even remarks about how good his swordsmanship is and comments Shiro could probably be as good as him if he trained hard enough. If it weren't for his undying hatred for the guy, he might have taken the compliment. That night, Shiro has a wet dream about swords and having sword arms. Man needs professional help that no one in the story is certified to give. Especially not Saber, who after noticing Shiro using Archer's technique during training, gets a little patty about him learning from other heroes. What the hell, Saber? You encouraged him by comparing them. Anyway, later on, Ren apologizes for Archer trying to kill him and tells him he doesn't need to worry because she put a leash on him. This bit of good news, however, is hampered by Shinji starting up the bounded field around the school, draining everyone in it of their life force. As everyone falls unconscious, spooky scary skeletons fill the halls. Saber chases down a nearby servant while Shiro and Ren go after Shinji, who is freaking out in the corner. Why? Because Ryder is laying dead on the floor. Before he can be questioned, he runs off scared. When they meet back up with Saber, they find out Caster showed up and is most likely the culprit for the murder of Ryder. With the people at school taken care of, the group leaves out through the woods behind the school where Archer shows up to badmouth Ryder for no real reason other than being a dick. Saber gets pissed and picks a fight. Archer, however, has to decline because the seal placed on him won't let him hurt Ren's precious little Shiro. After a bit of puzzling things out, they realize Caster's master is traveling to and from the temple every day, so they decide to ambush them once they have their identity. That night, Ren haunts Shiro's mind. Our boy is getting down bad. And this night's friend of Archer Dream shows him being stoic and become hated by people because he never communicated. Why does everyone in this town need a therapist? Later on, Ren thinks that this NPC is the other master, so Shiro strips him down, revealing no command spells. We then cut to Shinji arriving at the church where Kire gives the lad another servant, golden boy himself, Gilgamesh, who will miraculously not murder Shinji during the brief time he's his master. When we get back to Shiro, he decides to visit Sakura to see how she's doing after Shinji's bounded field fiasco. On the way, he runs into Rin, who's spying on Gilgamesh, who's stalking the Mato household. He leaves after a bit, and Rin tells Shiro that Sakura isn't available right now, but he'll need to check back in on her next route. Later on, Taiga causes Shiro to have an existential crisis, and I am starting to wonder if any of these people have heard of therapy. The next day, while enjoying lunch, the NPC lets it slip that the school stoic Mr. Kuzuki is in fact a resident of the temple. And to add on to this, his fiance moved into the temple a month ago, around the time Castor showed up. So Ren and Shiro, now known as Team Chaotic Good, do the only rational thing they can. They jump their teacher after school. Unfortunately for them, said teacher has hands and absolutely body saber with his bare hands. Is it strange I want the version of the story where he fights all the servants? Luckily for Team Chaotic Good though, Shiro figures out how to project Archer's swords and he's able to fend off Kuzuki long enough that he and Caster decide to head off. Because yeah, obviously he was her master. At night, Shiro doesn't sleep from how much pain the projection put him in because he isn't allowed to break physically or mentally. We could again to the adventures of Shinji and Gil as the two are in the Mato's basement, a bug filled horror show that will unfortunately need to be explained in the next round. The important thing now though is that Gilgamesh hates pests. We are the pests. Shiro wakes up to find that he can't feel the left side of his body, a fact that doesn't elicit any panic. For the last time, Shiro, you need some help, man. After school, he plans with Ren to take down Caster, and they decide fighting her at the temple is too risky. 
Soon after, Ren verbally abuses a tiger. Later, the two talk on the porch, where Ren reveals that she is a mage simply because she finds it fun. When she questions Shiro about being a mage, she finds out that he just doesn't have fun. Too much baggage weighing him down, so he feels guilty if he tries to enjoy anything. Ren storms off, planning some form of attack on Shiro. Saber calls him out for his injury, and luckily for them, Archer shows up and helps sort out Shiro's nerves. Turns out the pain was mostly just Shiro's body getting used to doing magecraft correctly. Things don't stay nice, though, because Shiro and Archer literally can't go five seconds without arguing. And unfortunately for Shiro, he doesn't get a break the next day because Rin launches her attack by dragging him on a date. Saber attack is long, and Shiro has to deal with a one versus two battle all day. But even he begrudgingly has to admit by the end of it all that it was pretty fun. What isn't fun, though, is them getting back to the Emiya house to find Taiga being held captive by Caster. Shiro tries to trade his command spells, but Caster attacks him, leading Saber to jump in and take the blow from Caster's Noble Phantasm Rule Breaker, an OP as hell ability that lets her take Saber as her own servant. To rub salt in the wound, Caster's first order for Saber is to kill Rin and Shiro. He resists as hard as she can, but attacks Rin. Shiro does a Shiro, though, and takes the blow, and Saber's resistance gives them enough time to escape. Rin makes sure Shiro doesn't bleed out before heading out to find Caster. Shiro tries to help, but Rin calls him useless and points out that his wounds aren't healing like they used to with Saber around. She proceeds to jump off a building for dramatic flair, and Shiro is barely not dumb enough to follow her to the fight. Nah, just kidding, our boy still hasn't discovered self-love, so he's off to find Rin to help. Before that, though, we do see another one of Archer's dreams. This time, it shows how after becoming a servant, he's been forced into a limbo, where he is summoned to see the worst of humanity disappear and repeat that cycle endlessly. All right, man, you get a pass. You can be as sarcastic as you please. Anyway, after spending a whole day searching, Shiro eventually gives up on finding Ren and heads to the church to ask advice from Kirei. Well, turns out that's where the fight's going down, because Caster killed Kirei to take the Holy Grail. She didn't find it, but... A for effort. Archer calls out Caster as Medea and decides Ren is dumb and boring, so he says he's working for her instead. Before Ren can get away, Kuzuki tries to kill her, but Shiro jumps in for the rescue and Archer negotiates for the former master's lives. Surprisingly, Caster agrees, and the two escape, where Shiro and Ren bond over not regretting things. And he comforts her when she cries and confesses to having feelings for her. Out of options, the duo turn to the only person who may be able to help them in this situation, Ilya. <laughs> Ooh, bad timing. Gil showed up, bodied Heracles, stole Ilya's heart in the most literal sense, and after a small confrontation, left without elaborating. We also get a better look into the bond between Heracles and Ilya here, and it will make you want to knock Gil's stupid fucking teeth out. Once again out of options, the two are approached by the blue dog, who offers to help. Seeing as they literally have no choice, they accept, but only on Shiro's condition that he doesn't make a move on Ren. The dog's a bro, so he respects it. While heading back, Ren drops a bombshell on Shiro. The pendant she used to heal him was one of a kind, but circumstances have shown two of them being around. Dun, dun, dun! The next day, they head off for the fight against Caster. Lancer takes on Archer because he insulted dogs, and the other two head inside, where they get demolished by Caster and Kuzuki. But Ren activates her trap card, Gym Membership, and she proceeds to lay the smackdown on Caster, before Kuzuki ignores Shiro to prove he's still the strongest master. And he's right, because Ren finds herself flying across the room. And in this moment, when all hope is lost, Archer pops back in after blocking the dog's gay bulge. Uh, I mean, gay bulge. And after repeating the same chant Shiro uses while doing Magecraft, a bunch of swords show up out of nowhere and stabs the shit out of Medea. As she fades, she tells Kuzuki her wish was granted, alluding to that she had feelings for her master, making Archer's double betrayal here a certified dick move. He understands this, though, and sends Kuzuki after her. Shiro rushes to the now-freed Saber, forgetting what happened last time he turned his back on Archer. The Swords One pushes him out of the way of Archer's deck, but is too weak to stop him from trying to kill Shiro. Until she makes a contract with Rin, that is. In order to deal with the full-powered Saber, he pulls out his noble phantasm, unlimited title drops, to try and incapacitate her, but Shiro holds it off. By now, everyone gets what's happening here. Archer is Shiro from the future, and he really, really wants to see his younger naive self dead, in hopes it'll free him from being a heroic spirit. He challenges his younger self to a duel, and they agree to fight at the Lost Child's Broken Castle, before Archer kidnaps Rin to give Shiro a 
bit of incentive. The next day, Shinji shows up to the castle to get Rin, and Archer agrees to let him have her after he has his fight with Shiro, proving that he is from the worst timeline for the guy. When Team Lawful Good shows up, Archer tells him and Saber about the shit he's had to go through, and Shiro responds by telling him to cope. The fight starts, and Shiro starts to see his older self's memories, and it nearly breaks him. Then Archer calls him a fake because he's just borrowing Creed Sugu's ideals instead of having any of his own, which really bothers him for some reason. Carrying on someone's will isn't really that strange a thing, so cheer up, Shiro, that might be the most normal thing about you. To be fair, he does get past that part quick, having a strong enough will not to give in. In fact, he sustains himself through sheer force of will for so long it even touches Archer's cold, dead heart, and he concedes the fight to his indomitable younger self. During their fight, Kirei showed up to kill Rin to use her body as a vessel for the Holy Grail. Shinji objects but backs down from Kirei's glare. The dog tries to stop his now-revealed master, but Kirei uses a command spell to make him off himself, so the dog catches the stick with his heart. Before Kirei can finish Rin off, though, the Giga Dog gets back up and takes Kirei with him, setting Rin free and stabbing Shinji so he would leave Rin alone, making Ku the bestest boy. Then he lights the room on fire just to make sure Kirei is really done for. Ren runs off and shows up in the main hall after the fight is done, but before anything more can happen, Gil shows up and tries to kill Shiro. Archer's finally learned some self-love though, so he pushes his younger self away from the attack. Gil basically shrugs and tells everyone that he's unleashing what's in the Holy Grail, a curse called Angry Mango that will kill humanity off. With that, he wanders off to put the lost child's heart in Shinji to turn him into the Holy Grail, which makes him look just as gross on the outside as he does on the inside. Knowing they have to stop Goldilocks, the team plans a strategy that involves Shiro using unlimited blade works to fight Gil solo. It's not the most powerful attack, but it is the perfect thing to fight the King of Heroes with. That night, Shiro takes Rin's most precious thing, her family's magic crest, which will allow him to take magical energy from her to power up unlimited blade works. Once morning arrives, they head out, with the humans approaching from the back while Saber heads in from the front to distract Gil. Unfortunately, Sasuke is still alive, and he still really wants that fight. With Saber occupied, Gil immediately finds the humans and his fight with Shiro begins, while Rin crawls through deluxe sewer water to free Shinji from the grail. Saber's fight doesn't take too long, though, as she's a lion and Sasuke is only good at killing birds. She runs off while he fades and finds Shiro near feet on the ground. He gives her a thumbs up, though, and says he's good, so she ignores him to help Rin out. And surprisingly, he means it, because Gil really does not stay a chance after Unlimited Blade Works has started. She gets to the back, though. She finds she can't help Rin because she's allergic to the sewer water and can't get near to help, which is unfortunate because now that Rin is in the lump of flesh known as the Grail, she can't get out. But it turns out that scheming bastard Archer was still alive, and he clears a path for Rin to get out of the Grail, giving Saber the chance to use Excalibur to destroy the monstrous blight. No Grail to get, Saber pieces out because we really never did anything to deal with her fraction line this time around. And things get worse for Gil, because now that the Grail is gone, so is his lifeline to this world. A black void noms him, and he tries to pull himself out using Shiro as an anchor, but Archer puts him to rest before Goldie can get out. With the day saved, Rin rushes to see Archer off. He asks her to look after his younger self and disappears with a smile not unlike the boy he once was. And then, life goes back to being fairly normal. Shiro agrees to go to London with Rin so he can stay with her, and the story draws to a close. And that is Unlimited Blade Works in a nutshell. Despite being shorter than the Fate route, a lot more happens in this one since there's less exposition overall. So this video had to be just a bit longer than the first. Anyway, that's two or three done. See you in a week or two to see what all goes down when we make this little ray of sunshine our heroine. Thank you for listening to my insane ramblings. See you next time.